A UN report warns of an increasing flow of weapons into the strategic Horn of Africa. This while the UN chief backs the call to end the arms embargo on Somalia that's been in place for 20 years. Would that be a solution or yet another problem in an emerging arms race in the region? And who stands to benefit from the turmoil? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. A United Nations monitoring team reports that an increasing amount of arms are being smuggled to Al-Qaeda-linked fighters in the Horn of Africa. It points fingers at what it calls networks in Yemen and Iran. The weapons shipments reportedly include machine guns and components for improvised explosive devices, or IEDs. Among the team's findings, Yemen has become an important hub for smuggling arms into Somalia. The weapons are being channeled through the autonomous Puntland and Somaliland regions in the north of Somalia and are then moved south into areas controlled by the Al-Shabaab movement. The Yemeni government has accused Iran of being behind the weapons smuggling and has formally demanded that Iran stop supporting armed groups on its soil. Last month, the Yemeni coast guards aided by the U.S. Navy seized a shipment of missiles and rockets that the Yemeni government maintained originated in Iran. It asks the UN Security Council to investigate the matter. The Yemeni government continues to fear rebellion by groups in both the north and the south of the country. And the US fears that there are also large factions linked to Al-Qaeda sheltering in the conflict zones. Well, to discuss what all of this means are our guests. In Nairobi, Peter Kagwanja. He is the director of the Africa Policy Institute. In Paris, Roland Marshall. He's a senior research fellow at the National Center for Scientific Research at the Paris Institute of Political Science. And in Washington, D.C., David Shin. He's a former U.S. ambassador to Ethiopia and a professor of international affairs at George Washington University. Welcome to you all. Let's begin with you, David Shin. Uh, the you. Horn of Africa was a battleground years ago during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. Are we seeing a 21st century version of fighting by proxy? Uh, there certainly is uh, fighting by proxy continuing in the region, uh, which is a region that has been awash in arms for many decades. Uh, the, the difference today is that the source of the arms is changing somewhat. But you've had a long uh, standing flow of arms from Yemen and particularly contact between um, al-Qaeda in the, uh, the Arabian Peninsula and the al-Shabaab organization in Somalia. That part of it is not particularly new. What seems to be relatively new to the equation is the Iranian involvement. Uh, although I think there has been some Iranian engagement in the past, uh, the focus on Iran now is definitely different than what I've seen in the last decade or two. Well, uh, Roland Marshall, your opinion on that? We are seeing perhaps a new player in the region or greater intensity by the players? Uh, I think uh, you're first very right to underline the fact that for, for decades uh, in the Cold War, uh, the USA and the Soviet Union was, uh, uh, provide, were providing weapons, huge quantities of weapons, much beyond what was needed to uh, countries in the region. And therefore, uh, after 1991, those weapons were uh, taken by armed groups and, and used different ways. Uh, Ammunition have been a problem, and is why uh, uh, now the involvement of Yemen and, uh, and uh, Iran uh, is, is a question. But we have to be aware that uh, those weapons came from many different countries. Uh, we talk only about Al-Qaeda, but what about South Sudan for more than 20 years? and as well what about Darfur. So we, we have to look, I think, the whole picture and not to focus only on one group, on, on one country. Well, I would as well stress that uh, the uh, Yemen involvement in Somalia is much longer than uh, Shabab, uh, and therefore, you know, it's very surprising to see that suddenly people look at Yemen this way while in the late 1990s so many people were raising 
question on why uh, the international community, especially the United States of America, was not acting in any way to restrain this trade that was uh, provoking or sustaining bloody confrontations within Somalia. We'll get back to that point in a moment, but I want to go to Peter Kagwanja with that uh, point that Roland brought out there about there are many groups involved here. We've got weapons from a variety of sources uh, not mentioned there was, of course, Libya as well. A lot of weapons coming out of the conflict in that country. Uh, how great a problem is this? We do have a multi-source supply, it would appear, of the weaponry. That's correct. Uh, the, the idea of the, the flow of illegal arms to the Horn of Africa is not a new phenomenon. And as you, as you, you indicated earlier, this can be traced back to the Cold War period. But what is new now is the influx of these arms from a variety of, of sources. Yemeni as, as a country is not essentially the one supplying arms to, uh, to Somalia. In fact, the, the government uh, over there, Sana, is complaining about it. What is happening is that Soma networks of Somali uh, fighters and sergeants are the ones in control of this flow of arms. And the, EU, the AU, uh, you know, the African Union uh, peacekeeping force in Somalia has basically uncovered a, a plethora of uh, arms uh, from Iran, uh, from North Korea, uh, others from Libya, and that this is indicating that there is a flow of arms from a variety of sources. Uh, what is new in this particular flow of arms is that it is, uh, it is feeding into uh, some of the global uh, you know, uh, tensions and conflicts, particularly between Iraq and North Korea and on, on the one hand and other you know, uh, Western and other global uh, actors on the other. And therefore, uh, you know, the, the, to approach the stemming of arms uh, in this region is critical, particularly so because it is now uh, incumbent upon the global uh, community to basically uh, uh, kind of protect the new government in Somalia, which, which needs uh, every um, you know, protection from uh, the, the global community to thrive against uh, al-Shabaab and other uh, allied uh, terrorist groups. Well, the issue of Somalia will refer specifically to in, in a short while, but maybe let's just step back here and consider why the region is of such great geostrategic importance. David Shin, uh, perhaps it's two words, is it? The Suez Canal and protecting the flow of traffic through that body of water? That's part of it, but it's also its, uh, it's geographical location uh, right next to the, the entire Arabian Peninsula Middle Eastern area where you also have large concentrations of, uh, of oil that are, are exported. And also the potential for um, engagement or um, interaction with governments in the, the Gulf states and in the Middle East where there are generally greater interests uh, than there are in, um, in East Africa. But even East Africa is growing in importance as uh, additional oil resources are being found there. And it is uh, strategic in terms of um, uh, problems in the, uh, the Great Lake states of Central Africa. So it, it has a, a certain strategic importance of its own, uh, not to mention all of the traffic that passes by the Somali coast and has been subject to piracy for the last five years. Well, Roland Marshall, I mean, the question is, uh, whose interest is served by fermenting chaos, by creating uh, uh, conflict within this region? Well, uh, first, it's not because you have uh, the supply of uh, weapons, ammunition, that you have a conflict. Uh, second is uh, people may be interested more in making money than really pus pursuing a, a specific policy. Uh, and maybe uh, third, uh, you know, we now uh, focus very much on, uh, on Iran. Uh, but uh, what about the others? We know that uh, as well uh, weapons came from uh, you know, the former Soviet Union republics that are not uh, on any uh, uh, diplomatic agenda internationally. So I w first I, I have some, you know, I, I just want uh, that we keep the whole picture as our Kenyan colleague uh, mentioned and not focus on only one country. The second is, uh, yes, uh, this is an area of, uh, of, uh, of, of break where the even during the Cold War, the, the, I mean, we, we didn't mention, uh, you know, throughout the Cold War, one of the issues was not to make 
uh, the uh, Red Sea and, and Arab Lake that was very much in the mind of many Israeli and then American policymakers. Uh, so, of course, this has been reframed by uh, globalization, the end of the Cold War, but still we see uh, that there is uh, a very strong uh, issue li linked to uh, the nature of the regime in the region, starting from Egypt uh, up, to, up to Somalia. And to a certain extent, uh, yes, he, he has become uh, the, the playground for, for a number of countries uh, outside the regions. Uh, Iran may be one of them because of his strategic alliance with Khartoum, but there are others in, in the West uh, to, uh, you know, to, to promote their clients. Uh, Somalia inherited uh, from that competition, tried to play it uh, for quite some time. So it did well under the, the Cold War. Uh, but uh, over the last 20 years, uh, the, the end result of this uh, competition was basically the continuation of a, of a civil war in Somalia. Uh, Peter Kagwanja, we hear that there are, are many groups involved here, yet we see the focus of the UN monitors um, on what it calls networks in Iran. It appears to be almost a singled out for this report. Is, is this a red herring, do you believe? Is, is, is uh, there the possibility that Iran is being unfairly labeled as the prime mover when there are many, many forces involved? Um, <clears throat> I think the, the point to, to emphasize here is that um, Somalia is a country caught between a transition from what you can call a war economy, uh, dominated by warlords and other criminal networks, and a peace economy which is now beginning to evolve around the new government in Mogadishu. And therefore, uh, what you see is not uh, essentially a coordinated uh, process of exporting arms to Somalia. It is basically a way, I mean, a networks, uh, Somali networks or networks of Somali warlords finding uh, sources of arms. And I think this is where Iran becomes one of the major sources. You, should, uh, you, you remember that Iraq, Iran is facing uh, global sanctions on multiple fronts. And therefore, it, it to naturally look for whichever way uh, is available for it to make a dollar or two in order to keep its economy soaring. And uh, war economies are usually a very good source of these kind of illegal uh, incomes. And uh, it is not, uh, you know, confined to Somalia or the Horn of Africa. You'll also find it in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and other uh, trouble spots in Africa. So the focus on Iran uh, must be seen with that, within that larger context of a country uh, facing serious sanctions. Uh, that is why we're also bringing into the equation uh, North Korea, another country facing global sanctions, and another country also coming to equation is Libya, which is uh, in a kind of a semi turmoil in the post Gaddafi era. And the flow of arms in, from these countries is easier to obtain than you would. Some, uh, one of my colleagues, Marshall from Paris, mentioned uh, Russia or the, the former Eastern Europe, uh, which is another volatile area or source of uh, this kind of arms. Therefore, uh, singling out Iran is not just a matter of uh, indicating the volatility of, uh, of the country itself, but the natural trend by such countries that are facing it, uh, 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 embargoes or sanctions to seek softer areas of softer directions for their flow of arms and other things that they can market easily uh, for economic reasons. Well, and let's just step back here, if, if we may, uh, Peter, uh, and targets. if we may just step back here and um, just take a look at that. Somalia has experienced more than two decades of uninterrupted conflict and for much of that time has been without a functioning central government. In 1991, President Mohamed Siad Barre was ousted by rebels and fled the country. Civil war broke out across Somalia. Between 1992 and 1995, the United Nations intervened in a bid to restore peace. The largely U.S.-led mission ended in failure. More than 10 years later and following the September 11th attacks, the U.S. opened a base in neighboring Djibouti amid fears that Somalia was becoming a safe haven for al-Qaeda fighters. In 2006, the U.S. backed an Ethiopian invasion to topple militia forces that had taken control of much of southern Somalia. A year later, an African Union force was deployed in Somalia. 
And last year, Ethiopian and Somali troops began a coordinated offensive against al-Shabaab. That group's grip on the south was largely broken. Then in August, Somalia's first formal parliament in more than 20 years was sworn in. Well, the U.S. formally recognized that new government last month, and now we see diplomatic moves underway to end the arms boycott. Let's go to David Shin on this particular point. Um, the U.S. has recognized the Somali government. We now have a coordinated um, campaign, it would appear, to end the arms boycott. Is there a linkage in this? Uh, I'll certainly address that point. Let me make one uh, clarification, though, of something you said earlier when you referred to the international intervention in the early 1990s being a failure. I would agree that it was a political failure, but we, f we must remember that it did end the famine in Somalia, and that's what it w really was all about in the beginning. So I think that part of it has been lost over time. As far as the current situation is concerned, the recognition by the United States last month of Somalia, I think, may be related to its support for the Somali government, which has specifically asked the United States uh, to help end the arms embargo. So there may well be a link there. But I think no one should be under the illusion that, that even if the arms embargo is ended, that it's going to make much of a difference. The, the, country, the region has been awash in these arms for decades, as Roland Mar Marshall pointed out earlier, from a variety of different sources. And the fact that you simply end the arms embargo, which would allow the government of Somalia to obtain arms easier, uh, is all that it really does, because the government already obtains arms it just will make it simpler to do so and in effect uh, level the playing field somewhat with those uh, organizations like al-shabaab that receive them illegally so that's really all that's happening here i think in terms of removal of the arms embargo well peter uh, kagwanja what is your reaction to moves to end the arms embargo yeah. of somalia I, I think I would, I would go for a gradual uh, removal of the, the embargo rather than a, a, a rapid and whole scale, whole scale uh, removal of those sanctions, uh, largely because even at present, uh, with the uh, permissions of, uh, or provisions by the UN Security Council, the new government can obtain a, a degree of, uh, you know, of arms to secure itself. Uh, at the same time, there is need to train the security forces in Somalia in order to be able to, uh, you know, uh, put not only the men but also the arms in, co in control in a manner that can be monitored easily. Uh, I'm not uh, personally opposed to the idea of lifting the, the arms embargo, but I think it requires some coordination and uh, some gra gradualism in doing that, taking into account uh, the uh, imperatives of allowing Somalia to uh, progressively uh, become, a, you know, a come into the global community, uh, which has started with the recognition of the government by the U.S. and other, I mean, Turkey and other countries. Um, I would add uh, to, to, to that end that um, the culture of warlords in Somalia is beginning to become a thing of the past, but it is not yet in the past. We still have pockets of resistance, not only of, of al-Shabaab, but rivalries within Kran still see and therefore uh, that, all that calls for a more gradual process of lifting the arms rather than just assuming that, um, rather assuming that uh, you can give Somalia a clean bill of health and therefore release relieve, uh, the, relieve, uh, the arms embargo. Uh, well, so yeah. well, Roland Marshall in Paris, I'd like to uh, put to you this whole issue of firstly of the U.S. recognizing the new Somali government, uh, the moves now to lift the arms embargo. Is this too soon, do you think? Is recognition premature? Is the removal of an arms embargo on a state that is still to prove itself too soon? Well, I, I'm sure the, uh, the new uh, Somali president wants to prove his people that he could recover the full sovereignty of his state, yes. Now, as an observer, you could raise, uh, you know, three reasons why you might not be so supportive. 
Uh, the first one is uh, maybe a number of states, uh, more or less, uh, in maybe not so often in the in the mainstream, may uh, offer weapons as a way to uh, bring uh, about a political alliance with Somalia. That is not really what is needed at this time. That could disturb regional efforts as well. Uh, the second issue is, of course, when you trade weapons and you buy weapons, there are always allegations of uh, kickbacks. It did happen uh, in South Sudan uh, with huge amount of money. It did happen in, in Uganda. Uh, so therefore, uh, you have to be cautious that you have the accountability strong enough uh, despite uh, a, a president uh, who is a very honest person uh, to make sure that you don't spend more than what is needed. And the third point is the Somali National Army is not yet, yet, is not yet uh, an institution as such, so you, you, you may take the risk of seeing parts of those weapons ammunition uh, sold to other uh, armed actors, whether Shabab or mi local militias or, or whoever, uh, either in Somalia or in the region, because let us not forget that uh, Shabab might be, might be weaker today in Somalia itself or in South Central Somalia, but there are strong uh, concerns about what may happen in, in Kenya, especially at the time of the elections. Yes, indeed, uh, we've got the Kenyan election coming up as well. But David Shin in Washington, D.C., we mentioned earlier, but uh, we're looking as well at, at, at countries like um, Saudi Arabia, the events in Yemen obviously having a, a major impact and a major threat to Saudi. We, we, we've got a series of threats in a series of countries all within this particular area. And a constant factor that we are seeing in it is, of course, increasing U.S. involvement. Uh, the support of the Sana government in Yemen, uh, now recognition of the Somali government. Is there a change in U.S. policy? Is it upping its participation within events in the region? There certainly is, uh, is more activity uh, aimed at trying to counter these extremist groups, uh, particularly following developments in uh, Mali and the Sahel region, which uh, I think is, um, has thrown a real uh, fear in, in the minds of, uh, of Western countries. And I think there also are probably growing links between some of these organizations and what is happening in Somalia. On the one hand, Al-Shabaab is a weakened organization. It has been squeezed by Kenya in the, in the southern part of the country, in the Juba area. It has been squeezed out of uh, Mogadishu, the greater Mogadishu area for the most part. But at the same time, it has done some expansion up into uh, Puntland and even into parts of Somaliland. And its links with some of these other groups uh, seem to be at least holding their own, if not growing. And it wouldn't surprise me that uh, some of these weapons have actually come out of Libya, where there were huge storehouses of weapons that have gone to a variety of groups, and they might well have made their way uh, down to Somalia. Well, Peter Kagwanja, uh, we hear there that Kenya has been squeezing the um, Al-Shabaab fighters from its side uh, of the border. But this just intensifies as well of how great the threat of, of turmoil within the region is, is that it has a domino type effect that can run down not just in the immediate horn of Africa, but through the continent as a whole. Yeah, you, you are right. Um, the Kenya century to Somalia changed the equation within that country by basically pushing Al-Shabaab and its allies from the southern part of the country, uh, basically forcing it to uh, center its activities to the, uh, more, much to the north, and that's why the current flow of arms is traced to a country, uh, say parts of Somalia that are considered safer, that is Somaliland and also uh, Puntland. Um, Within Kenya, uh, Al Shabaab has, uh, has adopted new uh, method, methods of, uh, you know, fight back, uh, including uh, basically uh, bombing, uh, throwing uh, grenades and other explosives to uh, public transport, to mosques, uh, churches, and other uh, places where the public uh, is concentrated, and, and therefore uh, it, it really has uh, destabilized Kenya in a sense when the country itself is looking uh, into the future uh, in next month of an election that itself is uh, taunted to have some difficulties because of the previous experience with uh, post-election uh, post violence. Well, remembering too, of course, those uh, elections coming up in Kenya. At that point, 
Thanks to our guests, Peter Kagwanja in Nairobi, Roland Marshall in Paris, and David Shin in Washington, D.C. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. You can send your feedback to us by email. The address, InsideStory at AlJazeera.net. I'm Mike Hanna. Goodbye for now.